It's time, once again, to talk about some scary books. I'll be delivering my monthly review of all the horror I read in February 2023. Well, we begin with a bit of a confession. I'm deeply ashamed of myself because I only managed to read four books this last month. That's well below my average. But I can explain myself. Three things contributed to my rather slow month, and some of them are also why I'm getting this recorded and posted a few days later than I originally intended. First of all, February is the shortest month of the year, so I just didn't have quite as much time as I'd like. Yeah, it's only a difference of a few days, but it turns out those days can make a big difference. Second, it's been a stupid busy month for me. I've been working a lot on a lot of different fronts. It's the busy season at my day job, plus I've been working very hard on several projects. In fact, one of them is this project right here. These 600 or so pages represent the first draft of the first volume of the Rocky Mountain Paranormal Case Files. Turns out writing that took a lot of my time. And now, of course, the real work of editing, legal review, clearing copyright, and so forth has to begin. And then there are the other volumes that still need writing. The bad news is that means I didn't have as much time for reading as I would like. The good news, both for me and for y'all, is that things are moving forward and you should expect to be able to read that, hopefully relatively soon. I also have some opportunities to expand my business empire, such as it is, in some exciting and, yes, still spooky new directions. It's too early to make announcements right now, but some big things are happening behind the scenes over here at Phobophile Central. So, you know, stay tuned. And the final reason I didn't make it through quite as many books as I'd like is that the first one was a bit of a slow read, and so we'll go ahead and begin our discussion proper there. I mentioned in my previous video that I'd started reading this book, and now, of course, I've finished it. The book in question is The Discovery of the Unconscious, The History and Evolution of Dynamic Psychiatry by Henri F. Ellenberger. Now, it's not really horror, of course, it's about psychology, but not everything I read is horror, so I won't belabor the point too much, except to say that if you're interested in psychology, particularly dynamic psychology, this might just be the definitive history on the subject. Obviously, it's a massive book, and what's more, it's very dense and somewhat dry, so it took me seemingly forever to get through. But that doesn't mean it's not interesting. It's a fascinating read, and I learned a ton about a subject in which I was already reasonably well-versed. Of particular interest for horror fans might be some of the early chapters that explain how much of psychology grew out of a variety of exorcism rituals. But I imagine anyone with an interest in psychology, whether they're a horror fan or not, can find something to enjoy here in this book. While we're on the topic of nonfiction, I also read The First Ghosts, Most Ancient of Legacies by Irving Finkel. Dr. Finkel is one of the curators at the British Museum and one of the world's leading experts on cuneiform writing and ancient Mesopotamian culture and history. In this little book, he turns all of that expertise to the subject of ghosts and treats us to a fascinating exploration of the very first ghost stories committed to writing. It seems as long as people have known how to write, we've been writing ghost stories. And the evidence suggests that that is part of an even longer tradition of ghost lore in what we might call the period of prehistory before written records existed. What's remarkable about this book is that it's sufficiently packed with detail that even the most expert of academics will find it an invaluable educational resource, yet also written with such humor and accessibility that it's welcoming even to the non-expert reader. 
Of course, as a horror fan, I approached it from the perspective of comparing ancient ghost stories with the ones we still tell ourselves today. And on that topic, it's a true wealth of information. But also as a history fan, I was similarly fascinated by the sort of peek behind the curtain into the lives and culture of a society that paradoxically feels both familiar and alien to us some five millennia later. Though not a horror book in the true sense of the word, I think it will catch the attention of most horror fans, not to mention ancient history buffs, and it manages to be not just an excellent book, but indeed one of the best I've read so far this year. It was one of my most anticipated books for 2023, and now that I've read it, I'm not disappointed in the slightest. In fact, I could prattle on about it for hours. Instead of doing that here, though, I've planned to make another video in which I will discuss how these ancient Mesopotamian ghost stories compare to our own in the 21st century. If you're not yet subscribed, be sure to do so and ring that notification bell so you don't miss out on that video. And if you're interested in reading Finkel's book before my video comes out, I've put a link down in the What's It so you can find the book easily while also helping to support my work here on this channel. Links, in fact, to all of the books I'm discussing today can be found down in the What's It. While you're subscribing and purchasing, do be sure also to like this video, share it with a friend, and never forget to use the comments section as our very own weird little book club. But getting back to the book reviews, another one I'd listed as one of my most anticipated of the year was How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. I was thrilled to receive a copy this past month from the Nightworms people, along with a signed book plate, no less, which we can see just here. So as a collector of signed books, I was thrilled to get this, and I dug into it with great eagerness, curious to see what Hendrix would do to bring his trademark sort of quirky and often self-aware style to the classic haunted house story. Well, this is not quite what I was expecting, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I will say, if you're looking for classical, you know, sort of ghosts rattling chains in an old house, you're probably going to be disappointed. Though there are elements of the haunted house in the story, the villain or monster here is something rather different. And it would have been easy to come across as frankly cheesy as hell, but somehow Hendrix managed to make his sort of villain or monster believable. And I'm very carefully avoiding mentioning what the monster or evil is in this story, because that might be considered something of a spoiler, even though it's revealed relatively early in the story. I still don't want to ruin anything for anyone. Along similar lines, I will say that while this is not a horror comedy per se, it does have some humor in it, and Hendrix used his sort of trademark quirky sense of humor to give us a few lines and a few scenes that managed to make me even laugh out loud. I don't think it's really all that scary of a book, and arguably not even as tense or scary as some of Hendrix's other works, but it is a real delight to read beginning from troubles settling in a state that made my inner legal nerd go dancing, all the way to a climax that seems fitting for any horror story. So even though How to Sell a Haunted House was not what I expected out of a haunted house story, it's still an excellent book. Lastly, I finally got around to Stephen King's Doctor Sleep. It's the sequel to The Shining, and it came out something like a decade ago, which honestly just makes me feel old now that I've said that out loud. For some reason, though, it took me a long time to get around to it. My copy had been patiently waiting on my shelf for all these years, but I just hadn't read it. I think it's partially because I'm such a fan of The Shining that I was nervous a sequel just might not live up to its predecessor. 
In fact, with regard to The Shining, if you're interested in a sort of deep dive into the similarities and differences between the book, the movie, the miniseries, and the opera versions, I have a video on that subject as well, and y'all should go watch that as soon as you finish this video. Links down in the what's it as usual. Well, getting back to the review, in this case, Dr. Sleep does not live up to The Shining. It couldn't possibly. The Shining is one of the best horror books and movies ever. But I'm pleased to report that the book is nevertheless still a very good read. It follows the now adult Dan, instead of Danny, Torrance on a new adventure. Along the way, we see both some new characters and some familiar ones, and we learn a lot more about what The Shining is and how it works. And as is often the case with Stephen King, the book is a truly excellent character study and manages to follow up on The Shining's treatment of alcoholism, all of which is very good. However, if you're looking for something as scary as The Shining, this isn't going to be it. There are certainly some gruesome scenes and a few good creepy moments, but the sheer horror many people experienced while reading or watching The Shining just isn't quite here. That doesn't make it a bad book by any stretch. I actually think it's one of the stronger of King's relatively recent works. Rather, it just means that you need to set your expectations appropriately. It's great to spend some more time in the world of The Shining, but a lot of time has passed. The characters have grown, the author has changed, and the world just simply isn't the same anymore. So why'd I finally read Dr. Sleep now? Well, the Horror Pack people sent me a copy of Mike Flanagan's film adaptation a couple months ago, and there was no way I was going to watch the movie before I'd read the book. So I finally read the book, and then I watched the movie. A full review of the latter will be included in my forthcoming video, in which I review all of the Horror Pack movies from the last six months, and that's coming up very soon. But just to give you a little preview, it's good. Mike Flanagan was absolutely the right person to handle this particular adaptation. Unfortunately, that's all I managed to read in this last month. I'll try to do better in March, though if you could see all of the work piling up on my desk, we'll just have to see what happens. Regardless of how many I get through, hopefully I'll find some good ones to share with y'all. Either way, that brings us to the end of this video, so as always, take care and stay scared.